Hey guys, um, so this is the lecture that I was trying to have done by, by yesterday, but it got dragged on until today, so sorry about that. Uh, this should be the last lecture before uh, spring break, and you know maybe over spring break you'll have a, uh, some time to go through the, the lectures and make sure everything makes sense, and maybe ask questions by email if you like. Um, and we'll have some homework assignments coming up after the uh, after the break. All right. Okay. So this is the this is the uh, kind of s the standard slide deck I've been using for my pharmacology lectures. I have adjusted it, and I will post the updated version on the on the iLearn site. Okay. Um, so we did this already: the peak glycoprotein efflux pump and the X-ray crystal structure for this. You can look at the earlier lectures where we discussed this. Um, all right, so we did this uh, last couple lectures, and um, and this is kind of where we are uh, in the whiteboard sequence. First, we did basic definitions, then we did an introduction to pharmacodynamics and uh, intro to pharmacokinetics (PK), the ADME stuff, uh, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. We talked about clinical pharmacology and a little bit about toxicology. This is all on the whiteboard. Um, okay, so, and we, we did uh, a couple of these things already. Drug names and nomenclature we did last time. Drug targets we also did last time. One of the things uh, I, I did for this lecture is I expanded the topic of drug receptor interactions. So there's some more stuff I want to talk about about drug receptor interactions. You got a basic picture of this last time, but there's a little bit more we want to do. And um, so, anyway, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about drug receptor interactions. Uh, dose response, we already pretty much talked about. And then we're going to talk about agonists and antagonists. Okay? All right. So, anyway, yeah, uh, if you downloaded this set of slides, you should download another another copy of it because uh, it's changed a bit. And I, I think it improved because I, I went into more depth and th into the drug receptor interactions section. Okay, all right. So the parts that I that we did already, I'll skip over as I go forward. Uh, you can look in the last lecture. If I say, oh yeah, we skipped over this, you check the last, last lecture. Um, but we're gonna ha have a little more emphasis on drug receptor interactions, all right. So we did the drug name stuff last time. I'll skip over this. Aspirin, we talked about this in the trade name. Bufferin. Uh, we did Tylenol, or 4-hydroxyphenyl acetamide, uh, also called N-acetylparaaminophenol, but it's more most commonly known as acetaminophen or Tylenol. We did this last time. We also did the 5-fluorouracil, uh, which is a clinical anti-cancer drug. So we did this last time. We talked about Taxol a little bit. It's a beta tubulin um, uh, polymerization inhibitor. It's used as a clinical anti-cancer drug. Um, yeah, the names are weird. It's commonly called Paclitaxol. That's the, the, the generic name, non-proprietary. And then the trade name is Taxol. And it's an injected substance. Okay, so drug targets overview, what makes a molecular drug? We did this last time, so I'll breeze over it quickly. Um, chemicals that perturb biological systems for therapeutic effect. Often they, often they are proteins, DNA, not always. Um, exceptions, antacids, we mentioned last time. Also monochloroacetic acid, which is a war treatment that, that destroys human papillomavirus. Yeah, we did this last time. Okay, uh, and it, it all depends on the lower pKa due to the chlorine. It makes it a, a stronger acid. And versus acetic acid, which is more something we would, we'd consume as vinegar in foods. All right, uh, so we did this also, protein receptors or DNA. I'm not gonna go over this again. Different kinds of proteins that drugs might interact with, ligand gated ion channels, G protein coupled receptors, enzyme linked receptors, and intracellular receptors, or, or a protein that's in the cytosol. Did this, and then DNA binders, intercalators, we did this last time, methidium bromide, 
not really a drug, but it is a DNA intercalator. We use it to stain DNA gels. It is actually a carcinogen, I'm pretty sure. So if you do electrophoresis, you, you don't want to get this done on your, on your hands. Usually I have to definitely wear gloves when working with thidium bromide. And the deactinomycin, which we mentioned, also is an intercalator. So all of this was from the last lecture. Okay, and the crystallography, we showed this last time, the uh, nicotinic cholinergic receptor with nicotine, we showed this last time, and it's a pentamer structure, nicotine is the little red spherical um, uh, drawn molecule, and then when it, the agonist binds, there's an ion exchange, and then other agonists work as well that we saw last time. Okay, GPCRs, G-protein coupled receptors, beta adrenergic receptor in complex with an antagonist, like a beta blocker. We saw this last time. And I will skip over this because we did it last time. So there's carazolol and it binds. It has a downstream effect and causes kind of like suppression of the downstream um, actions and it kind of decreases the heart rate and blood pressure because it's an antagonist. Okay, indinavir, we talked about this, HIV protease inhibitor. Uh, yeah, talked about this last time also. This is the same thing, it's just a different view of it. It just sits inside the hole and it blocks the protease from operating. Okay, zytobutene, this is AZT, we did this last time. So you can review this stuff from the last lecture but it just, you know, is the, the AZT is this thing that gets incorporated into the growing DNA chain. Okay, let's see. And there's another view of it. Deactinomycin, we saw it's the yellow thing that's, that's bound to double-stranded DNA. And it binds, and that kind of really has anti-cancer effects and prevents DNA replication and cancer um, will it can stop cancer growth. This is the with, it, with the atomic structure, and there we are. Okay, so now now onto the drug receptor interactions. Okay, so this is uh, kind of where we where we're continuing. We we did a couple of these interactions, but I added some more really interesting and cool ones. So the ones we did see last time were electrostatic, so, um, hydrogen bonding or van der Waals type dipole interactions, dipole-dipole, um, and dipole ion, like anion and things like that. And uh, Lipitor was one of them that we, sh we showed. This is a, a hydrogen bonding interact interactions with the binding site HMG-CoA reductase. Lipitor, of course, is a cholesterol lowering medicine. So these are hydrogen bonding interactions. Um, pivagabine is a, this is actually an ionic interaction of a, like a carboxylate with a guanidine type uh, thing, maybe an ar arginine. Um, this is an uh, antidepressant. I don't think it's actually used nowadays, but uh, it does show the, the sort of uh, electrostatic ionic interaction between the two, the drug and the amino acid. Uh, and then an ion dipole, so, uh, uh, sorry, dipole-dipole, which we saw, it's like a delta negative interacting with delta positive, dipole-dipole, um, and an ion dipole where you have a full ion uh, interacting with a delta positive. And this, this drug is a uh, sedative hypnotic insomnia drug. Zeleplon is actually used in the clinic. Okay, so in a greasy drug structure and greasy receptor structure, these are hydrophobic interactions. I added a little bit to what I presented last time. So what did I add? Uh, a possible mechanism for how, how this happens um, is, is shown here that I found from a book. So this, this kind of, it's, uh, this is actually from 1970, so this is from an earlier pharmacology textbook. This kind of shows that if you have the receptor, like a receptor uh, greasy chain and a drug sort of greasy chain, sort of, you know, why, why would these two want to be attracted to each other? And uh, what happens 
is that uh, right right now and before they're actually bound, so this is like pre bound pre binding. Uh, the water is really ordered all around the receptor part and also the drug part. So what happens when these two bind and form kind of like a complex, now you the receptor and the drug. So that, that actually it creates a lot of disordered water. So right now it's initially it's kind of ordered and then it's disordered. So is that a, what kind of thing is that? Is that enth enthalpy? What's this thing? Sorry. I don't know. Um, is this enthalpy or entropy? Well, if you're increasing the disorder of water molecules, uh, then it is, is an entropic effect. And so that's kind of why this happens and why a greasy drug might interact with a greasy receptor. Okay. Um, all right, and this is the reference essentials of molecular pharmacology from 1970. So this is, this is a kind of early idea of like how entropy might might um, drive this sort of process. And this is the example we provided last time, uh, butemabin, which is a kind of a greasy ester, a greasy ester, and it interacts like with isoleucine or something like that, and 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 in a hydrophobic type interaction with the butyl group and the uh, iso uh, butyl group, sec butyl group. And this was uh, local anesthetic, part of the cetacane um, gel drug mixture. So this contains like a few different chemicals that are all local anesthetics. I think it might be used in dentistry and things like that. All right, so we also talked about um, uh, briefly covalent inhibit inhibition and it's a different kind of drug receptor interaction. We mentioned this in the last lecture and we also learned about it when we talked about uh, biotics. The, the classic uh, molecules, clavulonic acid, which uh, inhibits beta bacterial beta-lactamase um, and serine 70 as a nucleophile as a hydroxy group. Uh, would attach to the beta lactam, open it up, and um, basically covalently modify the, the enzyme, and that would prevent it from operating and working. So we talked about that last time, and uh, but this we have not talked about, and this is uh, an idea that we have uh, different kinds of aromatic rings. Uh, one that's maybe electron rich. And one that's electron poor or electron deficient, and they might form a complex. Um, what kind of groups on a molecule on a benzene would would create an electron richness? Electron donating groups or electron withdrawing groups? It should be electron donating groups. So things that you know with a lone pair or something that can add, add, add electrons to a benzene will make it the ring air electron rich. And electron poor would be types of uh, molecules that uh, suck electrons away from the aromatic ring. An example would be chloranthanolol, chloranthanolol, and here you have electron withdrawing groups decorated around the molecule. Chlorines are pulling electrons away. The nitriles are. So this is an electron poor or electron uh, deficient molecule. Um, and over here we have a tyrosine that is electron uh, rich because the, the hydroxy group has lone pairs that kick electrons in. Hydroxy group is a very good electron donating group. And so you kind of have an electron rich benzene, an electron deficient benzene, and it forms an interaction, right? And this is called a charge transfer interaction. This molecule is uh, a fungicide. And a wood protectant is used in botany, maybe in carpentry or things like that to protect wood. It, it kills uh, fungus growth. Uh, it's also a human carcinogen, so it's not like something we would use as a drug. Uh, it has a couple names. Uh, Bravo is one of them, and here it is kind of used in a botany setting to kill fungus. Another type of interaction is a pi stacking, pi pi stacking interaction. What does that mean? 
Um, well, of course, you can imagine two molecules that have pi electrons, they might stack. This is kind of like the charge transfer interaction, except except we don't necessarily need electron donating groups or withdrawing groups. And here's a case of this molecule, leucosamide, which I think is an anti-epileptic drug, um, where it has a benzene attached via CH2 to uh, this nitrogen. And, and it just kind of, there's an interaction between um, between this benzene and like maybe a phenylalanine in a, in a receptor pocket. And these kind of things are additive, you know, so if you have a couple different types of interactions, uh, it, will, it will bind effectively to the receptor. And so uh, always, you know, there will be a couple of different interactions, and not, not just one of them. And yes, yeah, an anti-convulsant, anti-seizure, anti-epilepsy drug. Uh, you should know that pi pi stacking is also a critical component of DNA alpha helical structure. So beyond just drugs binding to receptors, um, this is a nice figure that sort of shows that that uh, the bases like guanidine will hydrogen bond and base pair with cytosine. Adenosine will hydrogen bond and base pair with thymidine. So there's a, this kind of mutual hydrogen bonding or, or arrangement, Watson Crick, um, base pairing and hydrogen bonding that keeps uh, alpha, you know, the, the alpha helix together in DNA structure. But there's also pi stacking, or, or as we call it, pi pi stacking. Where these sort of these aromatic ring systems like guanidine and, and adenosine will actually interact in a in a uh, uh, complementary manner. So these two, the, the the top piece will will also pi stack with the bottom piece, and so that uh, yeah. So in general, you have the combination of both of these effects: the hydrogen bonding and the pi stacking. And some people actually think the pi stacking interaction is more favorable. Um, to the DNA structure than, than hydrogen bonding. Okay, what other, what other kinds of drug in, receptor interactions are there? Cation pi. So this is not going to be pi pi, it's going to be cation pi. What does that mean? Maybe we have a positively charged group on a drug that is interacting with a, uh, a pi system, like a benzene, or like maybe a uh, an aromatic amino acid or something. Here's an example. Um, this is lisdexamphetamine. This is different than the, the molecule amph well, amphetamine or methamphetamine uh, because, well, it has, it has more to the uh, structure, I guess. Uh, a lysine. It looks like there's a, there's a lysine attached. This molecule here is amphetamine, which is the CNS stimulant that you You've probably heard about. Um, anyway, this this is an example of a cation pi interaction where the amine, which is positively charged, the terminal um, nitrogen on this lysine, is uh, interacting with a, uh, a tryptophan, right? And this is actually a positive uh, interaction. Why is this? Why do you think this happens? Um, is, it, is it clear that the top thing is charged? Um, what we will see in a second is that, um, of course, you have a lot of electrons, and electrons are negatively charged. Um, so there's kind of a, an electron cloud, a negatively, negative electron cloud uh, that interacts, basically, with the positive charge. So you have a negative-positive interaction. Yeah, this is the, the drug Lysdexamphetamine dimesylate, which the dimesylate is probably two mesyl um, anions on the, on the two nitrogens. Okay, and then also note that the cation pi interactions are found in a couple different uh, places. One is drug protein interactions like, like this. It's also actually a very common thing in just protein structure. So proteins will have these kind of interactions 
and key, it keeps the protein together. It keeps the, the structure of the, the protein together. I'll show a couple of both of these in uh, using X-ray crystal structures in a second. Oh yeah, these are a couple of the key references the, for this idea. This interaction, I mean, it seems like a silly little thing, but this is like, you know, 20 years of work figuring this out and characterizing it. And it's Dennis Dougherty at Caltech. And these are a couple of his papers. PNAS is the proceeds of the National Academy of Sciences. It's a very um, prestigious journal. Uh, he also wrote a chemical reviews paper, Chemrev. 1997, uh, which is Chemical Reviews is a great journal that has um, review articles. So it might be like a 50 or 60 page article that just reviews all the published literature on a topic. And in this paper, they were reviewing the concept of cation pi interactions. For a kind of quick summary, you can also check out the Wikipedia page, which is, is pretty reasonable for, for this, this topic. The other thing is that it's usually between tryptophan and, and or tyrosine uh, in, in terms of the kind of the top part. And these are, there's an electron, uh, a cloud, it's a negatively charged uh, electron uh, cloud around the uh, benzene because you have, these are both sort of donating groups, electron donating. Arginine uh, or lysine are, are commonly used as the positively charged thing, which like here is a lysine. Very common in protein structure, it's, it's arginine though. So we'll see a couple examples of both of those in a second. Now why does this interaction occur? I kind of gave you a hint a second ago on how how the, the benzene may have like a negatively uh, charged component to it due to its uh, aromatic ring system. The pi electrons above and below the benzene create a negative charge. This, this kind of shows that. So you have a bunch of um, a bunch of um, pi electrons and they kind of create a negative, uh, a partially negative charged cloud. Um, overall, the, the molecule is neutral, and so there's sort of a pot, it's kind of partially negative in the middle and like a, above and below, and it has to be balanced out. So the positive, there's like a positively charged space that's kind of around around the ring. Uh, how might aromatic substituents change the interaction? So if I, this is a benzene, and this also, you know, you can observe this with like sodium even. So, so there, there is an interaction even with like a sodium cation. Isn't that crazy? B benzene we think of as a, as just a you know, neutral organic solvent. Uh, but there is an interaction between sodium and sodium cation and, and benzene. And it's actually, a, we, can, we can study that and measure the, the interaction. How might aromatic substituents change this interaction? So what if I attach a thing on the benzene? And what kind of groups might enhance the effect? What kind of groups would enhance the effect? And what kind of groups might diminish the effect? Think about that a bit. What kind of groups might enhance the effect? And what kind of groups might diminish the effect? Um, I would imagine that if you have something that, that donates electrons in, that it might enhance it, right? Then you have more of a negative charge. But if you have something that's pulling away, it's pulling the, all the electrons away from this cloud, that might diminish it. Well, that was exactly observed and by the Dougherty lab, and so this, this shows a couple different things, and they're, they're measuring, I think computationally, I think is computationally, um, the binding energy of sodium cation interacting with different kinds of benzene, whether it's with a electron withdrawing group, like a nitrile, or a, a partially um, withdrawing group fluoride versus nothing at all, versus like nitrogen, which is definitely a donating group. NH2 with its lone pair kicks in. It's, it's a strong electron donating group. Well, the binding energy are these numbers. And in this case, bigger is better. So it's not like a delta G where, where smaller would be better. But you can see that 
very clearly who's got the highest binding energy, where the which would be the, the tightest extent of binding, it would be this guy on the right. And that kind of validates what we were just thinking about, you know, if you how you might enhance or diminish this effect. There's also the already. Um, heterocycles, like tryptophan has an indole, right? Tryptophan amino acid has an indole. Indole is, uh, uh, I can't show it this second. You'll, you'll see it in a second. It's a benzene and then a five member ring with nitrogen. Um, in order to see um, this effect, we often use something called an electron density map, and it's useful to predict this. When we do electron density maps, red color is, means electron rich, so there's a lot of electrons. Blue color means electron deficient. So let's look at a couple of these heterocycle type things. So indol, for example, indol has a lot of red, and that means there's a lot of electron density. And that means kind of like a negative charge, right, in the middle of the benzene. Benzene has a little bit of red there too, but it's not as good, right? If I compare these two, I might say, oh, well, there's more red color, so this may be a, a better interaction. Now, nitrogen, the electron density is kind of localized on the, sorry, this is not, this is a pyridine, right? Pyridine is this molecule. And you might say that the um, electron densities may be more localized on the nitrogen. And so this doesn't have that much of a, if any, high stacking effect. And so this, these are computer generated images that you can create with some easy programs that we have access to. One's called Spartan. So um, I think we have that in one of the, the, the CCB lab in, in our department, uh, which is a way that, that we can actually create these, these uh, electron density maps for almost any molecule. If you can fit it, plug the, the molecule in, and it'll do the calculations to generate these kind of maps. Okay, so yeah, we would say that this is maybe a good um, example of a of a uh, um, something that might be kind of negatively charged. This is sort of in the medium category, and this may be bad because we would not expect this to really pi stack. All right, so here's a couple examples of just pi pi. Uh, uh, cation interactions in protein structure. So this is ju this is uh, something called the Vaccinia virus protein BP39. So it's just a kind of a random protein, but we can see the how these two amino acids kind of line up, and uh, how, wh what's the interaction? Well, arginine is positively charged, so there's a positive charge there. You can't see it, but it's, it's definitely positive, and then so it's a cation. And then it's it's interacting with this this tyrosine, and of course tyrosine has an electron donating group, um, hydroxy group, right? We can't see the proton, but it's there. And so this is a perfect interaction of a of a cation pi system that are interacting. Uh, these are I'm all using uh, pi mole, which is my cool visualization program. So it's this, and what this is showing is that. Like, like what, what would the function of this be? And it stabilizes the alpha helix. So this alpha helix, now, not only is it kind of stabilized by its intrinsic structure, but it also has this kind of element that further stabilizes it. So some proteins actually have this in alpha helical structures that are maybe is a critical alpha helix. Here's a pretty cool one. Um, so this is a, a classic example of a uh, cation pi interaction, and it's uh, a protein called glucoamylase. And this protein has four interactions <laughs> all simultaneously. It's pretty amazing. Uh, so there's a, that's a lysine there, lysine 108. And lysine 108 is interacting with tryptophan 120, tryptophan 52, tyrosine 50 and tyrosine 106 all simultaneously. So all of these are, you know, kind of hold, this, this holds this portion of the protein together, is, is how you might think about it. 
But yeah, all of these have PDB codes, so you could try to look this up in the IC3 and ICN3D structure. You can also in that in that website you can find these different amino acids. Remember how you did that with the um, in your tutorial that we did before. So it's a crazy example of four simultaneous interactions. This um, we saw before. This is the ligand gated ion channel, nicotinic cholinergic receptor. Nicotine binds. Uh, nicotine's up here. It's the, the red spherical structure, um, but it actually binds using a cation pi interaction with tryptophan 149. So let's see what that looks like. This is what we saw before, and if we we can zoom in now, and I I just use my PyMol program um, to zoom in and look at the amino acid environment, and here you can see the what's going on is. Uh, there's a positively so you can't you can't see the protonation, but this is a this is an alkyl tertiary amine, right? It's a nitrogen with three things on it, and that's that's th this nitrogen. There's a methyl. You can see it right there. there, there there's the nitrogen, and there's it's a tertiary amine, right? Alkyl tertiary amine. But the pKa uh, you know makes this basic, and and so this. This is actually a basic thing. Uh, I mean, sorry, basic uh, charged ligand. So it's got a, it's got an actually a, a proton in it, a neutral pH that is going to be protonated. So there's an extra proton and it's positively charged. So this whole thing is positively charged, and you see this tryptophan right next door to it. And there's there's this is understood to be a a, a cation pi interaction between. The uh, amine, the ammonium, positively charged ammonium, and the tryptophan. There's also other things around, like these tyrosines. I just don't think they're they're close enough to have an interaction. Um, there's also like a carbonyl there, so that's delta negative, right? So it's delta positive. That's delta negative. The delta negative is possibly interacting um, with a positive charge. It's an ion pair, so uh, dipole ion. We call it ion dipole interaction, right? Delta negative interacts with positively charged nitrogen. Okay. Uh, you know, and this is just one agonist for this receptor. So there's other ones like acetylcholine, which happens to also have a positive charge. It probably is also interacting with this tryptophan. Uh, I don't have the crystal structure with the acetylcholine bound to it. But I would expect to see that, and because there's a, you know, that they both have, they both are ultimately positively charged. This has the positive charge fixed into the molecule, whereas nicotine, it, it just has a, it's due to its basicity, it's protonated, and so, so you know, in the bound conformation, it's it's going to be positively charged. Okay, what other kinds of drug receptor interactions do we have to t talk about? Halogen bonding, halogen bonding. This is a weird one, and I, I, I didn't know too much about this um, until maybe maybe six months ago or a, a year ago. I, I, I was reading about it for this course. What does that sound like, halogen bonding? Kind of sounds like hydrogen bonding, right? Halogen bonding, hydrogen bonding. Well, this is going to be kind of like hydrogen bonding, and it's a, it's a very, it's a weird type of interaction. Halogens appear, you know, when we think about halogens on a molecule, like a chlorine or a bromine, what do we say, is delta positive or delta negative? Halogens. We usually say they're delta negative, right? We usually say a halogen is delta negative, but at specific geometries and angles, they're actually partially positive. The, the halogens are actually partially positive, and I'm putting some exclamation, question mark, exclamation. And it kind of acts like a proton, like a, the way a proton is positive. And it is kind of like, it kind of acts like a proton and kind of acts like the concept of hydrogen bonding, which is kind of weird. And we call it halogen bonding. So let's see kind of a example. So this is a R group, you know, benzene or something. 
here's a halogen, and we kind of say, oh yeah, there's some delta minuses around, the surface is generally delta minus. We say that at these different corners of the halogen, it's nucleophilic, it could be nucleophilic, it could actually, uh, depending on what you're, what's around, this, these could be Lewis basic, and, and lone pairs could actually go, maybe, maybe attack something. Okay. So this is the kind of nucleophilic end. So what are we talking about here? This partially positive thing. Well, at a very specific area, it's almost like a cone of geometry, there's actually an electrophilic end. Uh, halogen bond donor site. So this, so this is, the halogen is actually at certain angles, and it's kind of almost 180 degrees from the R group. There's certain areas that are actually delta positive, delta positive, kind of like a proton, and like if we had a, like a OH or something like that, you know, like a hydrogen, that would be delta positive also. Like if I have a, if I have an alcohol, like carbon, oxygen, proton, carbon, oxygen, proton, the proton is delta positive and can hydrogen bond. Well, in, at certain geometries, this can also, and it can hydrogen bond, but we can halogen bond. Isn't that crazy? We'll see examples of this in a second. It's really cool, I think. This is a this is uh, found in one of the papers that I, I saw. That's sort of, this is a, this is bromomethane, BrCH3. What it's showing is there's kind of like a surface around the bromine that's that's kind of traditionally delta negative. That you're you're used to seeing delta negative, and then we have a hole, a hole. And the hole is the delta positive part. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very weird. And until I, I, I read about this, I, I didn't I actually didn't know much about it. But it's it's definitely uh, present in drugs. Um, these uh, are a couple of papers. Another chemical reviews paper, J Med Chem Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, that uh, talk about this. And if you want to learn more about them, these papers are useful. The Wikipedia page is actually not that bad. Uh, there's there's a lot in the Wikipedia page, and, and may, if you want maybe the, I, I think that kind of interesting stuff, look near the bottom, it says biological macromolecule section, and it, it has some kind of interactions and or some uh, discussion, some discussion about biological macromolecules and, and halogen bonding, okay? So yeah, the electrons sort of form a ring around the BR, and there's an electron hole. They call it an electron hole. It's kind of like, and, and being an electron hole, it's, it's kind of delta positive, right? Because there's a lack of electrons in a certain area that's roughly 180 degrees from the R group. The hole occupies a region roughly 180 degrees from the R group, but it's not, exa it's beyond, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not just a, like, a, like a single point, it's actually a kind of a, a big hole, okay? The strength of the interactions uh, is, well, iodine has the biggest interaction, and it's roughly like a hydrogen bond, and then BRR is a little less of an interaction, CL is a little bit less interaction. Fluorine actually has much less of an interaction. I think fluorine is maybe more just delta negative all around. But these kind of larger ones, the chlorine, the bromine, and the iodine, actually have a larger, larger hole. Here's an example, and this this is a, one of the classic examples that uh, people have used when describing this. Is uh, these are phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Here's the inhibitor. It's the small molecule structure, and the idea is that, and here's like, like a tyrosine. And the tyrosine OH is it not normally the OH, it's really the O. The O is delta negative, right? The oxygen is delta negative. The bromine at the right orientation is actually delta positive. It's delta negative on some parts and delta positive at other parts. Kind of weird idea, right? This paper's uh, Zoo J Metcam 2011, and there's the page number, so you can actually read about this example. Um, okay, and in this paper, different halogens were incorporated into the inhibitor, like at the at this position where the BR is, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, and then they kind of looked at all the IC50s, 
they did some calculations and measurements and basically found that um, they basically validated the whole idea of halogen bonding uh, and that the, the extent of halogen bonding the extent of halogen bonding here correlated with the IC50 the inhibitory uh, uh, you know the potency of the inhibitor so inhibitory potency IC50 correlates with the calculated strength of the halogen bonds and I'll show that in the next slide so this is the same example that we're just showing um, and so now what they're going to we're going to show a little table with the predicted binding energy of the interaction versus IC50. I think this is done computationally, and there, there's a lot of kind of high-end computational techniques that give the binding energy. What this is showing is we have a couple different compounds: uh, one, two, three, four, and five. X is uh, the, the the different atom: H, F, C, L, B, R, or iodide. D is the distance, and there's not much change in the distance. It's all roughly around the same. Um, predicted and also determined, I think, by X-ray crystallography, I think. I'm not too sure how they did the, figured out the distance. This is not that exciting. The angle is not that exciting either, but it does show that it's not exactly 180 degrees. It's not like, you know, if it was 180 degrees, it would be like, carbon, bromine, oxygen, and it would be 180 degrees. But, it, but there's, there's a little bit of a cone, a, a cone of this effect. Okay, what's interesting though is the delta E, which is the, the bi determined binding energy, and also the IC50, which is the inhibitory concentration. Uh, the top is kind of, of uh, the top is kind of uh, not, not the best inhibitor, with just a, a hydrogen there. And the, the the delta E for for you know for delta E to be uh, better, it should be a smaller number, like a like a more negative number. Uh, so this is not the best delta E in the series. IC fifty. Remember, IC fifty uh, for a good inhibitor is a smaller number, and this is a kind of a high high number. I mean, it's still nanomolar, so 50 nan 51 nanomolar is actually a pretty reasonable inhibitor. It's just not the best in this series. And then we have a, maybe a slightly less uh, lower interaction, or, or not, not as tight interaction, and that's with the fluorine, right? So with the fluorine, it's maybe a, a weaker interaction, a negative uh, 2.1. Look at the IC50. It's terrible, right? So if these compounds, it's actually pretty bad. Um, and then we have maybe a little better of an interaction, and we see that the, the IC50s jump accordingly uh, lower, so, that, so it's more potent for chlorine and bromine. And then look at this, iodine, which we said is kind of the best for this effect. The, the delta E is a very small number, so it's a, it's a tighter interaction, negative 4.5 kilocalories per mole. And look at the IC50 at 7.2. So there's definitely an improvement um, in iodide. The iodide is maybe the best of the halogen bonding um, interactions in this in this series of compounds. All right. So we just did these slides. Let's keep going. All right. So let's show a couple examples of X-ray crystal structures that, that show this concept of halogen bonding. Um, I think the first one is actually the, uh, the phosphodiesterase inhibitor. And I just realized there is an error here because this is showing the bromide, but this is actually the iodide version. So, so it says bromine here, but it's really iodine. And, but this, this is the tyrosine and, and there's, um, there's the interaction, the little dot, 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 yellow uh, line. And it's not, again, not quite, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely uh, less than 180 degrees. And there's sort of a cone of where the effect resides um, underneath where, where the halogen is. Okay. This is also these PDB files you're, you're able to either download or view with uh, ICN 3D if you want to take a look at them.
All right. Uh, this is an aldehyde reductase inhibitor. It's another kind of popular drug target that, that has this, there's a lot of in, examples of this kind of interaction. And, and here it's uh, the molecule has a chlorine on one end and a bromine on the other end. And there's a uh, halogen bonding interaction with the tyres, sorry, 3-enine-113-hydroxyl group. So there's a OH, there's an H, we're not seeing, we're not seeing the H's in this crystal structure. But the, the oxygen is delta negative, the bromine is delta positive, and that has the interaction. So three angstrom uh, interaction. Uh, here is, um, this is an inhibitor of the acetylcholine binding protein and here it's uh, the leucine 112 carbonyl. So, so, so there's actually a double bond O, C double bond O, and it's leucine 112. And this molecule has the uh, carbon bromine and the, the bromine's delta, delta positive, delta positive in this kind of uh, cone, you know, on the outside of the bromine. And then this is delta negative and it's a 3.2 angstrom interaction. So it's just another example of halogen bonding, which is kind of this weird type of bonding that you're maybe not used to seeing. Okay, uh, quick tangent on structural biology. Quick tangent on structural biology. So there's a, a website called Proteopedia. That's where I got some of these in our examples. And you should just know about it. It's a cool... Um, uh, resource for anything kind of protein structure rela related. Structural biology has to do with the structure of proteins and how they um, are involved in biological systems. So, I just wanted to mention Proteopedia. It's kind of like Wikipedia, but for protein structures. It's a nice web inter based interface uh, for finding x ray crystal structures that have specific property. I mean, they might be involved in a disease or something. So, you should take a, take a look at it. Um, it also has a lot of like just kind of discussion and and um, information and maybe liter literature references for for different proteins and like disease relevance and things like that. But the big thing is that it, it has it has quick references to like the PDB codes for looking up the the crystal structures and things like that. Uh, kind of like a Wikipedia for extra crystal structures. Uh, try Google searching these things. If you just want to take a, get a little glimpse into Proteopedia, try Google search Prote Proteopedia Table of Contents. That'll get you to where it shows the different topics, diseases, protein structural classes, etc. How about Proteopedia Cation Pi Interaction? This will have a discussion of Cation Pi Interaction and some of the examples of drugs that have Cation Pi Interactions. How about a Google search for Proteopedia halogen bond? This will do the same thing and give you some more examples and information about halogen bonding, right? Uh, when it gives you, when, when you go to this page, you, it'll often give you the PDB codes like 4OEW or something, and you can visualize them on its website. It has a kind of interactive uh, PDB viewer. Or you could uh, get the code and write and open it up in ICN 3D or, or Pymol if you if you're able to run Pymol. So yes, it's a very cool resource. Like I said, Wikipedia for protein crystal structures. Okay, dose response relationships. I think I did this. I'm not going to do it again. This you can you can follow this on uh, the last lecture. So we we talked about linear and logarithmic. Uh, dose response and how semi-log is preferable because you have a, a wider range of potency. Yeah, semi-log means one axis is logarithmic, the other axis is linear. In most cases we use semi-log. Agonist antagonist, we did this also. I'm going to skip over the agonist section. So if you want to review that, um, Look at the last lecture. We talked about we the, we we did this slide, and we also talked a bit about agonists. We didn't get to antagonists, so I'm just going to continue this lecture and the antagonist section.
agonists, we did this, potency, efficacy, partial agonists, last time, last lecture. So look at last lecture. Agonists, different potencies, these are the um, um, this just shows, yeah, that, that uh, compounds can have different potencies and all the agonists and there's different EC50 values. And then partial agonists, what we saw was that um, different, different agonists may have a different maximal response. So check out the last lecture for that. Antagonist inhibitors. Okay, let's do this one now. Okay, so antagonists and inhibitors. Uh, the IC50 definition from Wikipedia is pretty good. It's the, the half maximal inhibitory concentration, IC50, measure of potency of a substance in inhibiting a specific um, biological or biochemical function. IC50 is a quantitative measure. It indicates how much of a particular inhibitory substance, like a drug, is needed to inhibit in vitro a given biological process by 50%. So that's a pretty good definition of IC50. Um, this is a typical example. We, we showed this earlier, this, these kind of examples. Uh, in this case, the IC50 is um, the 50% point, but it's measured in concentration. So we find the 50% point on the y-axis and then we kind of drop down and this is about 300 something nanomolar and we also as you guys know uh, uh, we want small IC50s for potent compounds okay and in this case like we, we would titrate in more and more drug until we start seeing the effect and then and then the curve starts dropping down and then at, at high concentration we would see like zero percent enzyme or receptor function Antagonists are, we often call, often call inhibitors, antagonists are drugs that bind to receptors with good infinity, affinity, but they do not produce, produce substantial receptor stimulation. So we say they're low efficacy. So they, they block the, um, the effect of the receptor or enzyme or whatever. Okay, so now let's talk about different kinds of antagonists. Competitive antagonists versus non-competitive antagonists. What are these concepts? Competitive antagonists bind reversibly to the same receptor site as an agonist. Okay, so they might bind to the same binding site because they bind reversibly and compete for the same site. Their inhibitory effects can be surmounted by adding more agonist. Okay, so if an antagonist and an agonist are competing for the same sites, and then we, we add more agonist, then the agonist is going to have, uh, it can kind of erase the effect of the antagonist. Let's see an example of that. Oh yeah, let's first compare that with non-competitive. Let's compare that with non-competitive. Non-competitive antagonists either bind irreversibly so they might attach to the enzyme, like a suicide substrate type of thing, by covalent bonds, uh, to the same side as the agonist, or they bind to a different side, like an allosteric uh, binding site, which reduces the binding of the agonist. Um, and the primary effect of a non-competitive antagonist is that the maximal effect is diminished. The maximal effect of the agonist is diminished. So we'll show examples of competitive agon antagonists and non-competitive antagonists. Let's see examples. Okay, so competitive antagonist. So for this example, let's consider this molecule. It's called isoproteranol. It's a beta adrenoreceptor agonist. It increases the heart rate. It's used to treat low, slow heart rate. So if you have a maybe a blood pressure problem, a low blood pressure problem, or a low heart rate problem, you might take this as a drug. This is a beta adrenoreceptor agonist. 
And then let's consider this stuff. Uh, propranolol is a beta adrenoreceptor antagonist. It's a beta blocker. It blocks the beta adrenoreceptor. It's used to treat hypertension and high blood pressure. You can actually see some similarities in the molecules. They're actually kind of similar in some ways, but one's an agonist and one's an antagonist. All right, so we can see, we can look at, at uh, inhibition graphs and see um, how these two things might compete. All right, so if we just consider isopraternal proteranol by itself, the agonist, and we're just on the y, sorry, the x-axis, we're just measuring amount of isopraternal um, in concentration units on the x-axis. And then we're looking at the in increase in, in heart rate, okay, on the y-axis. And so if we add the agonist by itself, we add the agonist by itself, at low concentration, it, the heart rate starts jumping up, right? And it goes up, up top to maximal heart rate in this experiment. And then the EC50, the EC50, so we're, because we're, we're looking at an agonist, we don't consider IC50, we're, con we're just concerned with EC50. The EC50 is going to be right, right here, which is what, right, what is it, roughly 0 0.9 uh, nano, nanograms per milliliter, okay? It's actually cl maybe closer to ED50, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is that we add an agonist and we get an effect. We get an, we get an effect, and and this is this is kind of where that EC50 or ED50 is, right? Okay. What if we start titrating in propranolol, which is we're we're going to call that a, a competitive antagonist? Well, what and and we're still only looking at isopraternal, the agonist, on the x-axis, right? But look at what happens when we have when we add the antagonist. What happens to the EC50 of the agonist? What happens to the EC50 of the agonist when we add the antagonist? It shifts to a higher concentration, right? And so now it's a different EC50 value, r roughly in this graph, five nanograms or nanomole or whatever. Uh, it's a higher IC, EC50. And what if we do isoproteranol and we add twice the amount of the antagonist? What effect is that going to have? Well, that now the EC50 is even higher, right? And that this is the classic behavior of a competitive antagonist because this molecule, the bottom, the antagonist, is competing for the binding sites of the agonist. And the, the structures are kind of similar. You might expect a competitive behavior. That is what a competitive antagonist is, OK? Conclusion, propranolol is a competitive antagonist of the beta adrenoreceptor. It reversibly binds to the same receptor in competition with the agonist isoproteranol. Isoproteranol, <laughs> it's kind of a hard one to say. Okay, so th this is a great example of a competitive antagonist. What's a, what about a non-competitive antagonist? We, we talked about these. These might be something that binds Covalently, for example, um, and that's what's going to happen here. So here, uh, norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter that binds to the alpha and beta adrener adrenergic receptors. It also increases heart rate and blood pressure, and increases fight or flight response. And it's an agonist, right? And this is actually a naturally produced uh, compound that's produced in your body as a as a hormone uh, and a neurotransmitter. And phenoxybenzamine is an alpha adrenoreceptor antagonist. It's called an alpha blocker. It's also used as an antihypertensive drug. And interestingly, the, the chemical structure of this is a little uh, unusual for a drug because you have a nitrogen, two carbons, and a chlorine. And, and we have this, I mean, the chlorine's a leaving group. And you, you might expect that somehow maybe Maybe the, the, the receptor might attach to this or something, and I'll show that, a mechanism for it. 
But this is this is an uh, irreversible inhibitor. This actually binds covalently to the receptor through this weird uh, arrangement of atoms: nitrogen, carbon, carbon, chlorine. This will react and create an electrophile, electrophilic uh, site, and the receptor will attack it and attach to it. Okay. So we have an agonist and we have this antagonist. And, and the stepping head, this will be a non-competitive antagonist. So let's think about this. And uh, here we have, um, we have on the x-axis norepinephrine, concentration of norepinephrine. And on the y-axis we have increase in the, the increase in blood pressure okay so norepinephrine by itself there's a dose dependent increase in blood pressure so as you add norepinephrine you get a dose dependent increase all right and what happens if you we add phenox, uh, phenoxybenzamine if we add phenoxybenzamine into this this mixture well, this is going to irreversibly attach to the receptor and kind of inactivate the receptor in a dose-dependent manner. And so what you see here is that as we add this substance, and then, and, and then also we're, we're measuring the response of norepinephrine, we can see now nor norepinephrine has less of a response, right? <laughs> In, in terms of increase in uh, blood pressure. So norepinephrine has less of an effect because we're still adding norepinephrine, but we're also adding some amount of phenoxybenzamine, okay? And what if we add twice the amount of phenoxybenzamine? So now we're really, really inactivating the receptor and we're, we're covalently attaching to it. And what what's the effect is then we even have a, a less of a uh, maximal response. So the conclusion is that phenoxybenzamine is a non-competitive antagonist. So it's not competing. It's not like this is competing. It's this is inactivating the binding site. It's attaching to it, and it's preventing. It's, it's jamming the binding site with a molecule that will be covalently attached. And this could actually cause some toxic side effects. So it's not really used that often. Uh, as an antihypertensive drug, I think it's used in surgery, uh, maybe, because uh, it, it is eventually, eventually the protein will be recycled and, and um, you know, and the, these the covalent attachment will be irrelevant. But in general, we, we like to use reversible competitive um, antagonists that that can get, sort of get washed out of the receptor site. Conclusion, phenoxybenzamine is a non-competitive antagonist of the adrenergic response. It covalently attaches to the receptor and permanently, irreversibly inactivates it. But again, the receptor can get kind of destroyed through uh, cellular processes and, so, and be regenerated. So it's not like it's attached and will never be removed again. And, you, and, you're, you, and It's not like this is completely permanent in an organism. There, is, there are mechanisms to, for either, either the receptor to be uh, regenerated or um, re-expressed or something like that. Okay, so this just shows the two side by side. Competitive inhibition, isoproternal has a different EC50s. They all have the different EC50s based on the amount of propranolol that was added. And these, this is like a competitive inhibition. The maximum response is not affected by the inhibitor. It's a competitive antagonist. Non-competitive inhibition, norepinephrine has the same EC50. So that's the other thing is that EC50 uh, doesn't change in non-competitive inhibition. The EC50 is all the same. Uh, where, where the, uh, and by, when I say like EC50 for the orange curve, the 50% point is 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 you know it's halfway to the maximal response. So this is this is like the ha this is a hundred percent for the orange curve. For the orange curve, the, this is a hundred percent. And so when you say that it has the same EC fifty, this is actually the fifty percent mark for the orange curve, right? 
And that's why we say it has the same EC50. What about the red curve? Red curve is maximal response right there, and the EC50 is kind of the halfway point. So this is the 50% point for phenoxybenzamine. Okay. Norepinephrine has the same EC50 value regardless of the amount of phenoxybenzamine added. The maximum response achieved is diminished. That's what, that's what it appears to happen. Phenoxy, phenoxybenzamine is considered a non-competitive antagonist. Last question. How exactly does phenoxybenzamine covalently attach to the alpha, adrener, alpha adrenergic receptor, making it a non-competitive antagonist? So this is kind of the chemistry of that. It's kind of interesting, I think. So it's probably cyclization of the amine with the terminal chloride. So the nitrogen is going to kind of attack the carbon. Nitrogen is going to attack the carbon with the chlorine to create something called an aziridine, which is a, um, it's like an epoxide. And it's, I misspelled functional group. Anyway, it's kind of like an epoxide. And then that is electrophilic. So this is probably what happens. Is Phenoxybenzamine, nitrogen, lone pair, attacks the carbon, kicks off the chlorine. So this is like an SN2 reaction. It's an intramolecular SN2 reaction. This is the aziridine. It's kind of like an epoxide. There's an electrophilic intermediate. And then the receptor, one of the nucleophilic atoms in the receptor will attack and sort of be attached. So that's probably what's happening to make it covalently attached to the receptor surprisingly is that this is actually kind of how mustard gas is used. This is like one of the World War I kind of uh, uh, chemical warfare reagents or chemicals that was used in warfare, mustard gas. And what happens there is you also have a nucleophile, two carbons from a leaving group. And in this case, this is called a sulfur mustard. It's not, not the kind of mustard we eat. Um, but Sulfur that does this two carbons away is called the sulfur mustard. And so the sulfur attacks, kicks off the leaving group, and then you have this thing is called the episulfide, which is sort of like a aziridine, it's just sulfur based, electrophilic, it's like an epoxide. And then various biological molecules in your skin, your lungs, your DNA, etc., attach. And, and this is. Uh, very toxic. So this this kind of causes all sorts of bad stuff, blistering in your skin, blistering on your lungs, pulmonary swelling, third degree burns. Um, if you survive the uh, exposure, then you know later in life, you know this will happen. Your DNA will do this too. If it gets into your body, your DNA will attach this because it's an alkylating agent. And so now your DNA has this stuff attached to it. And so that is alkylation of DNA and it causes cancer. So yeah, most of these uh, mustard gas and chemical weapons have been um, outlawed by the Geneva Convention and um, aren't really used currently or, you know, not, well, here and there there's some kind of uh, worry about chemical weapons. I, I think this is pretty much like a World War I thing, maybe a little bit of World War II. Anyway, I think that's the end of this lecture. So we'll talk about more later.